<laughs> Years later, Cavett would describe being chilled by Jeffrey's glib tone during the interview, saying that specifically his affect was all wrong. Oh. That was the word that Dick Cavett used was affect. He was making jokes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, Cavett approached the subject with sympathy and gravity, but McDonald answered his questions with a tone, in Cavett's words, like he was fucking Bob Hope. Yeah. Like, affable, relaxed. He yeah. played the tragedy for laughs to the audience, saying that he was watching a late night talk show the night of the murders. Gave him, you know, you know when you're you know performing and doing comedy and yeah. you give that like signal to the audience, no. like, joke, laugh. No, I'm he, not a hack. No. <laughs> I've never done anything like that. I don't mug. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I never mug. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. He gave that signal. And yeah. they did laugh. Of uncomfortably, course. but yeah. they laughed. But after Cavett asked Jeffrey to describe the night of the murders, if it wasn't too painful, this is what Jeffrey said. I can uh, skim through it briefly. Uh, to get deep into it does produce a lot of, like, emotion on my part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and McDonald then claimed that he sustained 23 wounds in the attack, uh, saying, quote, You know, some of which they were potentially fatal. I could have died very easily. I was in an intensive care unit for several days, and I had surgery. You know, I had chest tubes in my chest. I, I can't believe how strong I was. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, and that's how I knew how weak my family was. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that I punctured my own lung with a scalpel? <laughs> 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 uh, and he goes, boing. Now, what's so foolish about this claim is that it was so easy to disprove. Jeffrey didn't sustain anywhere near 23 wounds during the attack, and he didn't come anywhere close to death. I mean, it was barely a minor inconvenience. He would have gotten a fucking, he would have gotten worse injuries from getting into a fender bender in his car. Yes. But it was that hubris, that need to be seen as the victim in all of this, that would lead to Jeffrey's inevitable downfall. If we look at narcissistic personalities, however, we know they're extraordinarily talented at distorting reality. So it is quite possible that Jeffrey came to convince himself that something close to his story actually happened. Well, the thing I keep hearing, especially from Errol Morris and other people, you know, like people who talk about this case, which is you hear it a lot in family annihilation stories, which is being like, there's no way that man who loved his kids would have ever killed his children. Like, like, what's the motivation? Like, always, right? Like, mm -hmm. in every crime story, you're trying to figure out when you're doing a police investigation, you're trying to figure out why. Because, you know, at the very end, that helps you kind of point to who did it, you know, like, who could be around the person who did it, blah, blah, blah. But the thing about a lot of family annihilations is that there is no real reason why. Like, there is, yes, there are certain factors, but as we talked about last time, be a fucking man and leave. Yeah. Yeah. Like, get a bus ticket, <laughs> go someplace else. Like, there's so many ways to not do this thing, obviously. No, and so now we know a lot more. Chris, bring up Chris Watts again. Yeah. He has mm -hmm. countless videos of him loving on his kids and being super sweet and being engaged and fake smiling and a bunch of Facebook videos and shit. But it's like, in the end, like... He just wanted a new life. Well, when when they say like so many times, like there's no way that that man ever annihilated his family. They said it about Jeffrey McDonald. They said it about Watts. What those people don't realize is that they knew a person that did not exist. They knew yeah. they, there was a, not, there they, was they a, met a fake guy. Yeah, there was a, that person was wearing a mask in those videos yes. when they were talking to their in laws and they were talking to their friends. They were wearing a fucking mask. You had no idea who that person was. You also, really sometimes it's that is the ultimate issue with stuff like that, especially if you're close. Is that, yeah. that you don't fucking you, you don't know anybody. Yeah. Anytime an entire family Eddie, I don't is know murdered. you. <laughs> Eddie, I don't fucking know you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm coming for you. <laughs> well, hey, honestly, I appreciate the heads up. <laughs> but anyone, like, anytime an entire family is murdered and the father is there and he's fine, he did it. <laughs> I like, it's like it's like any single every single time. Like well, you know, you're either the worst pussy on earth or you did it. Yeah, yeah you know. It's, well, again, but I also will say motivation is important. Yeah. So I understand why. Like, if there is no motivation, it is extremely confusing, and you can see why he's totally innocent. So I see more of the mud in this this week, but I'm still kind of firmly on the Jeffrey McDonald's guy. I mean, the motivation is he fucking popped his wife too hard, and he was, and she was like probably convulsed or some shit and he's like oh fuck now I gotta kill everybody yeah or I'm gonna go to jail you never got to though yeah. again you don't got to you yeah. just go like she fell on my bat like just like <laughs> say something else <laughs> but at the very least Jeffrey's narcissistic personality disorder guaranteed that he would never take responsibility for his crimes ever 
still to this day saying, nope, I didn't do it. Now, after the Article 32 hearing concluded, Jeffrey McDonald and his lawyer, Bernie Siegel, launched what can only be described as a publicity campaign maligning the military bureaucracy, saying that they'd put a grieving husband through needless torture while the real killers ran rampant. I've never heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never heard that. But then he did try to go get him, right? Isn't that true? Well, we'll get to that here in a second. Well, probably so they could keep the story straight and control the entire narrative themselves, Jeffrey and his lawyer told Jeffrey's father-in-law, Freddie Kassab, to stay out of it, asking him to not participate in further interviews to assure that Jeffrey's interests were, quote-unquote, protected. Yes. Yeah. Now, this set off a tiny little alarm in Kassab's head, the first of many. He also thought it was suspicious that Jeffrey was so eager to relive such a horrific night over and over again with the press. And remember, this interest is brought on by Jeffrey McDonald's behavior. Yeah. Like what he is doing is like, according to that documentary, kind of really put the timeline is that Freddie was like, he said, we talked to him in the front, the first episode was being like, honestly, if I had another daughter, I'd want him to marry. I want her to marry Jeffrey. You yeah. know what I mean? Like he loved Jeffrey, and they were there for him. And it was the Dick Cavett interview, yeah, where they sat and he watched him. And it was when he was making a laugh. He was making all the laughs and doing all the shit. Mm -hmm. He should have been broken. Yeah, he should have been a puddle of a man. It's just a thing. It's also again, you can't tell someone how they're supposed to react, but. But Every normal person way. on earth doesn't talk to another human again as long as they live if their family's murdered by a bunch of hippies. <laughs> or you just don't go on Dick Cavett and make a bunch of jokes. About it. Yeah. yeah, and to that point, it seemed to Freddie that Jeffrey was far more interested in doing interviews than in finding the real killers. Mm -hmm. Most of all, though, Freddie found it strange that the army didn't pick up the investigation concerning his stepdaughter's and granddaughter's murders after charges weren't brought against Jeffrey. But what Freddie didn't know was that the army realized that there was no point in further investigation because they'd taken their shot and they'd fucking missed. Yeah, and yeah. any other attempt to find the real killers would have been a waste of time and resources. They'd rather go away than look like fucking idiots. Yes. I mean, you know, it's, it's a part of it. Yeah. yeah. But there were two goddamn detectives who wouldn't let it go. <laughs> but we'll get to them later. <laughs> and so Freddie Kassab decided that if the army wasn't going to look into it and Jeffrey wasn't going to look into it, Freddie was going to do it himself. I love it. He just fucked. This guy got. He's got tense. time. He's, he's retired. Got his yeah. daughter's dead. You know, yeah. his, his kids are, his grandkids are dead. He's got nothing to do. Yeah. To begin with, Kassab went to Washington, D.C. and delivered 500 copies of an 11 page letter to Congress requesting a proper investigation apart from the Article 32 hearing to find and prosecute whoever was behind the murders. Now, after Jeffrey recognized that it would be very bad for him if his father in law looked into the case himself, he came up with a cinematic story that he hoped would satiate Freddie Kassab's curiosity. McDonald told his father-in-law that he'd gotten together with a bunch of other Green Berets and they'd tracked down one of the four intruders. After torturing him for information, they then killed him. And as McDonald put it, that guy's six feet under. It depends on where your theology is, actually, because some people might say he's a thousand feet above. <laughs> but I honestly, we looked into it. And the terminology that he used, which I thought he was just like, he's like, one down, three to go. Yeah. Good God. You yeah. know, and they're like, you know, him like smoking and pretending. Meanwhile, like he was barely a Green Beret. He barely. was just he was just in the department. He was a doctor. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if he went to prison for that fake murder? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I mean, like, as you can see, this smiling cat was murdered by Jeffrey McDonald. Yeah, and Jeffrey then emphasized that the brave Green Berets were on the trail of the other three, and they'd take care of it the Green Beret way, without all that liberal namby-pamby due, due process, process nonsense. nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Now, Freddie sort of said, he's like, all right. Like, yeah. he didn't really believe him. But after he saw Jeffrey on the Dick Cavett show, he changed his mind completely about his former son-in-law. See, what Freddie noticed most was that Jeffrey made no call to help find the real killers during the interview. No plea to call the authorities if anyone had any information that might lead to their arrest. Even the fucking Ramses always remembered to do that. Oh, yeah. And he's it's really like. It shows a lot about himself. Yes. Because, again, it was all just about, like, oh, this is being done to me. Everything's mm -hmm. being done to me. Can mm -hmm. you believe this tragedy? He didn't bring up the kids. He didn't bring up his wife. He no. didn't bring up fucking anything. 